All right, welcome to another episode of A Champion's Mind. And today we have a very special guest. He has done it all. He's a legend in the Muay Thai world, intercontinental champion, international champion. He's a Bellator world champion, also a Lion Fight world champion. He's fought everyone there is to fight, whether it's Sanchai, he's fought Saget Dao Payatai, he's fought Malay Pets the Siprapa. He's beat them all. This man is a very unique individual. He's Kevin the Soul Assassin Ross. Kevin, welcome to the show. How are you going today? I'm great, man. Thank you for having me. Awesome, man. Awesome. So first of all, uh, tell us, how's everything going in California right now, man? Crazy, like it is everywhere else. But I, I do feel that here, um, maybe it's not as extreme or maybe the area I'm in, you know, there's still people, you know, out and about as far as being physically active and going on runs and, you know, people in the park, you know, we're still shut down, of course, and, and only certain things are open. Mm. Um, but I think in comparison to a lot of places, and, and same thing for me uh, personally, it, it's it's not such a drastic change. Maybe that's just because of the way that I am and, and the way that I normally live. Is is This isn't that different other than not being able to go to the gym and stuff and, <laughs> and all that. But but again, in comparison to most people in the world, it's not as extreme. So for me, it's just, you know, it sucks, but, you know, it's not life changing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's good. It's good to hear that you're not going to, you know, it's not too big a change for your lifestyle as well. Now, obviously, the champion's mind is all about what separates the winners from the champions, the good from the great. In your opinion, Kevin, not limited to fighting, what does it take to become the absolute best in your field? a sickening obsession <laughs> i think i think i think to be great at anything you really do have to be obsessed with it to a degree and and it has to be everything to you because anything else you're going to slowly start breaking down when those setbacks happen when those losses happen when when you're tired or these unfair circumstances happen all those things happen to everybody regardless of where you're at on the spectrum and the only way to truly push through those is to have that obsession that focus if you want to say that that your eye on the prize you know is, is a common expression that knowledge that no matter what you're doing win lose or draw you are going in the right direction you're always learning you're always growing you're always trying to improve um I think that's what it takes to to continually grow, uh, because if you can grow through losses, you can grow through wins, you can go through neutral times, and and that's what it really takes is is a, a continuous, um, continually improving mm -hmm. through all, regardless of the uh, outside circumstances. Yeah, and it's funny that the question about obsessiveness is something that will come up shortly, but I obviously want to ask you about your mindset. What helped you develop your mindset? Have you always been a naturally strong-willed person or was there <laughs> no. a point for you? <laughs> Not at all. You know, I, I, I probably spent half my life being the exact opposite of what I am today, a very um, broken person. You know, really, I was a uh, someone that that had no – drive or or self-belief um i felt very defeated i had a very defeated uh lifestyle and very defeated mindset and i allowed that to keep me from ever going after these things that i desired and that was that was really the big the shift in my uh, perspective in my life was when i finally just had enough of that and i said regardless of how I feel, what, what the circumstances are, what limitations I have that are real or perceived, I'm going to go forward and go after this thing. And what that taught me so much just about life in general is everybody has things that hold them back, whether it's a, a mindset, whether it's a real situations, like you grew up in a poor, bad home or you're in a horrible situation, um, real or imagined, we all have them everybody has something they can point to as to why they can't achieve certain things 
Um, mm. And for me, it was just that realization that you still have a choice. Um, you still have a choice whether you go forward or whether you let that circumstance break you. And once I kind of snapped out of that, everything shifted, you know, and, and I started going this other direction. Um, not that it's easier. To, in a lot of ways, it's, it's more difficult to go in this direction. It, it's, mm. it's, it's, a, it's much more difficult to go in the right direction than it is the other one. It's just in the long run. Uh, you'll end up in a much better place. Yeah. So it sounds like obviously you, you were living in a way that kind of is 180 to where you are now. What was the kind of turning point for yourself? So, I mean, all of this really, uh, the starting point of all this was when one of my best friends passed away in 1999. And, and he was the only person I ever told about this crazy idea I had of, or this dream I had of becoming a fighter. Mm -hmm. And even when I told him about it, I don't, I wouldn't even say it was a dream. It was just something that was always there. Like this would be something I've always wanted to do. Something I was always drawn to, but never did for a variety of reasons. And he was the only individual I ever told about this. And, and he was very, um, he was like, why don't you do it? I, you know, I thought he was going to laugh at me because of what I said. And he just was, very complimentary he's like if anybody can do this you can do it and and mm -hmm. crazy thing is like people see me now but if you knew me back then like what are you talking about you want to fight for a living like that's <laughs> you know, as 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 your thing to do that's crazy um so yeah he he was the only person who told me he was very um um positive response and then he passed away about a year later and when he passed away I, I promised myself that i would do this i was like he didn't even get a chance to fail at a dream and i'm too scared to even try what mm. you know i need to live my life at, at least for him if not for myself at least for him he didn't he didn't get to do anything i need to do this unfortunately you know his his passing sent me down an even darker road that i was i was already on a bad going in a bad direction and then after he passed away it was just like sprinting to die basically and uh yeah. you know fortunately for myself i one day i just snapped out of it i was i woke up maybe two two or three years later and all this uh consecutive like bad circumstances kept happening and i finally started realizing like these are, are um signs you know like are, you need to stop going the direction you're going because nothing good's going to come out of it and one day it just just smacked me in the face that i just wasted another three years of my life ignoring this thing that i feel inside and if my friend was still alive and i knew that i wasted three years of my life he would kill me like <laughs> he would beat the shit out of me for doing this and then th that just smacked me in the face you know like how how fortunate we all are to have any ability, any, any life for that matter. And, and I was wasting it. I was wasting it because of fear and, and, and all these other reasons, but it really all boiled down to fear. And, and mm -hmm. finally I just, I just couldn't ignore it anymore. And that's all, the, that's all everything in my life up to that point was, was trying to bury that feeling, trying to, drink away that feeling or ignore that feeling for whatever it was everything was was to suppress that and, and and i just couldn't i couldn't ignore it anymore and it was a 180 pivot point in my life you talk about the feeling and um i'm sure there's people out there that may feel that way but they don't know how to express it tell us what was that feeling for you and how did you realize it was something that you need to turn your attention to i think the fact that it was always there almost made me try to bury it even deeper you know i think i think i i learned about muay thai when i was 14 years old and it was always it always felt like this calling to me like it was drawing me to it but because of all the fears and doubts and, and excuses that i had i had to suppress that and i suppressed that with with the lifestyle that i lived I had to I had to do something to push that voice out of my head um, that was calling me to do this thing, and then I did that with with, with drinking and partying and just pissing my life away. And uh, you know, like I said, it just one day I, I realized that that's I realized what I was doing. But prior to that, it was 
it wasn't a conscious decision. You know, I didn't, I didn't realize like you're doing all this to ignore this other thing. It was just, Oh, I'm just, I'm just partying. I'm having a good time. I'm hanging out with my friends. Yeah, I don't really know what I want to do, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, would, I, I was just putting a bandaid on something that would, that wasn't, I wasn't going to be able to ignore. Yeah. It sounds like something that it's almost like you're calling. Could you put that description into words of how it felt or was it just something that was deep, went deep inside? Yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't even say that it was um, what it really was. I just knew something was there that was pulling me in one direction and I was fighting against that. Mm. You know, it was almost like the current was trying to get me to go the right way, but I didn't, I didn't know what, what was that way. Like, you know, it was almost, almost that a fear of, I don't know what that is. So I don't, I don't want to go that way because I know what this is and I can, I can live here and I can function here. So I'm going to stay here and everything I'm doing is, is almost like trying to shut that door or ignore it, wow. you know, and, and as the years went on, it got more difficult. So I had to, I had to try that much harder to bury it. Yeah. That's crazy, man. So Kevin success or being the best doesn't happen overnight. You know, no one knows how hard we work, the sacrifices we make, the constant setbacks we experience as fighters, but I believe these all make an integral part of becoming the best. The failures are just as important as the wins. You know, um, you've been fighting for over 17 years. You've had over 59 fights, taking on the absolute best, never turning away or never, you know, turning anyone down, yeah. taking on the best of the best. You know, tell us about this journey for yourself. <laughs> it's been a long one, man. I I've, I feel very fortunate in the sense that from from my first fight, I really just got thrown into the deep end. I, I fought a guy with 30 fights already, he had 20 pounds on me, and he beat the shit out of me. So I had to face all of those things right out the gate, you know, and, and having to face that and then to, to face that opponent, to lose and to deal with that immediately was, was the most beneficial thing I've probably ever done as far as fighting. And it was unintentional, of course. And at the time was the worst thing ever. But now I can look back and, and understand how that all played into, you know, where I eventually ended up. And that was dealing with failure, dealing with loss, dealing with maybe you can't do this. And that was the question that I had after that loss. I was like, maybe, maybe this isn't for me because when I started – everything came to me so naturally. I just, I was picking it up. I was like skyrocketing uh, with my ability every single day. I mean, by the time I'd only been there maybe a month, people didn't know if I'd been doing it for years, maybe, you know, and, and that was, I, was I, I felt like I was on the path. I was mm -hmm. like, this is the way, obviously this is the way I'm supposed to be going because everything's working out for me, you know? And if it just is like, Oh, once you, once you, change your life and go the direction that's been calling you, everything will be easy. You know, and I got, I got spoiled for, for that whole nine months that led up to that first fight. And then that first fight was reality smacked me in the face. That is just because you're going in the right direction doesn't mean things are going to go the way you want them to go. They might, might, everything might point to the opposite. Like this is not the way you're supposed to go. And I had to confront that immediately where so many people that I was uh, fighting alongside of all of my training partners and stuff, many of them went years without ever having to deal with that. Yeah. But when they inevitably did, m the majority of them, uh, it just, they couldn't deal with it. And some of them never fought again. Some of them, it slowly started steering them away from the sport. And I, w I feel very fortunate in the sense that we're all going to face that eventually, whether it's a loss, whether it's a, just a unfortunate circumstance, whatever it is, you know, the more extreme it is, the more it really lets you know, do you want to do this anyway? Do you want to do this? Even if you're losing, do you want to do this? Even if you're getting hurt and injured and all these um, circumstances. And for me, I had to ask myself that. And it was, yeah, I want to do this no matter what. I get, I want to be the best, in the world or the best I ever can be, that might not be possible, but I can, uh, I can be the best that I can be, mm. even if that's not the best in the world. And that was the realization I had at that first fight was no matter what I'm, I'm going to be the best I can be. And, and it doesn't matter who that is 
in, in the world's perspective. That's it. That's in my perspective. And for me, that's what fighting does. That's what martial arts does. That's what any kind of way of pushing yourself does is it makes you a better version of yourself. And for me, it's fighting. Um, but that's just my, av my avenue, but it can be anything for anybody. Now let's circle back to your first fight you talked about. Was it your first fight that you lost against a guy that was a lot bigger? And uh, you got your yeah. ass, you were saying, yeah. I've had guys that train hard, like you said, they're naturally gifted and then it gets to the fight time and maybe they don't get the intended result they're looking for. You know, like I'm sure they can relate and they can, you know, they can take a lot from what you've shared there, but tell us, how did you, what was your mindset from there? Like, how did you re realize that you had to, well, how did you continue? So a big realization for me at the time was, and what stuck to me to this day is there, there are so many things that are out of our control. If you get caught with a good, good, good punch or, or you get sick the day of your fight or all these other things, but nobody can stop you from, from pushing yourself when you have the ability to push up like, like normal training. Nobody can control how hard and how focused you are. Only you can. Mm. The problem is, I find, is most people train as if everything's going to work out. Or, or yeah, maybe I got to push myself a little bit, but they don't train as if you're going to have the worst day of your life and you need to, to make sure you can still not only make it through the fight, but win the fight, even if it's everything goes wrong. So I think that really set that into my mind was you got to train as if it's your worst day ever and you can still prevail. Um, and, and like I said, that, that has stuck with me throughout my entire career. Like you can't dictate how hard I train. You can't dictate how hard I focus and how much I put into this. Your skill and ability level and in, in other circumstances might come into play, but this is one thing I do have control over and I'm going to take advantage of that. It's, it, you know, and it goes down to that whole uh, uh, um, focus on the things you have control over and let go of the things you don't. We don't have any control over so many circumstances, but there's a lot of things we do have control over that we choose to just let go. Like, like oh, it'll be fine. It'll be okay. No, sometimes it will, but, but there's those times it's not, and you need to have that extra. Yeah. So that, that was always a driving factor for me in, in my focus and my training and everything that I did was I have control over this. I'm going to, I'm going to control this to the best of my ability because everything else is out of my hands, which also let me, I think, let go of a lot of, a lot of those things. Like mm -hmm. these things are out of your control, you know, do, do what you can with what you can. Yeah. Control the controllables as they say. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Now, I'm sure that first fight was something that shaped you as a person and as a fighter, and you've come a long way since then. You've done some amazing things. What events uh, forced you to grow and adapt? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, like for me, as far as fighting goes, I feel, I felt, and I do feel like that was a, that first fight created a theme for my entire career was mm -hmm. Facing people you have no business in the ring with, uh, um, de dealing with pain and loss and, 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 and all of the, just the horrible things most of us don't ever want to face. It's like, you are going to face this and you're going to deal with this uh, throughout your career on different levels. So understand uh, that, that understanding of that being the way it was from the first day helped me so much. Um, and, and I see so many people that, you know, even if you have losses uh, until you've had that really bad one mm -hmm. and you overcome that, then you really can kind of understand it all and, and, and having to do that immediately just made everything else make that much more sense. Like you can take things as they are, as opposed to how they feel in the moment, you know, and that's uh, on a grand scheme and even on a small thing in a fight when you get hurt with something, some people they, that breaks them down and they just, everything starts to hurt and you start paying attention to all these other things that are going on. And some people say, well, yeah, that, well, that happened. So I'm already on to the next thing. There's nothing I can do about that. It's, it's in the past and, and I, I can only move forward and I can only learn. 
and that all of those things have been just just themes throughout mm-hmm. the process of, of 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 trying to be better as a as a person and a fighter starting so late which 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 gave me a, a unique perspective as well in the and losing so early all these things mm. played into all of these uh, beneficial roles in my life but it, it was also you know looking back is these things happen to everybody it's just a matter of what you do with them and and fortunately for me I, I pointed them in the right direction I used them as motivation I used them as as, as a driving force but some people use them in, in order to destroy themselves and mm-hmm. I think the fact that I spent 23 years of my life destroying myself and being on that extreme other spectrum has helped me turn negatives into positive in this part of my life. Wow. And that essentially is the essence of a champion's mind. And it's very unique, Kevin, for you to be able to do that. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, let's, I've got to ask you a question about uh, obviously cracking your skull for our listeners that don't know. <laughs> I actually learned this last night from one of my um, fighters. Um, tell us about that. You, you fought a guy in China in September, 2005. This dude was yeah. wearing a shin pad or a shin guard with a steel plate in it. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about that. The hell? <laughs> Which part, man? I, it, we fought in China. Um, so we did a, me and my buddy, Anthony Brown, we, uh, they called the gym looking for fighters to do a San Xiao fight. And we were Muay Thai fighters. And, you know, the, the way that we came up and the people that we came up around and maybe the era that we came up in was you take any fight you can get, you know, <laughs> anything, anything is better than nothing. And anything you get is experience and, and all of those reasons. Mm-hmm. And I think part of me has, just has that mentality anyway, you know, like, so what, so what if they have all this weight or experience or it's a different rule set and just, it's a mm-hmm. fight it's a fight and you're going to do it. So we went over uh, to China and there's so much uh, that went into this story that, that I could go on to for hours. And, 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 you know, part of the reason I'm writing a book about my life is like so much of this stuff, even when I express it to people, it sounds fake to me. It sounds like a movie. Mm. It sounds like bullshit. Uh, I just don't know how to express it in a realistic situation. Mm. Um, But yeah, so I fought this guy, uh, he kicked me in the head, like right at the beginning of the round, dropped me, I popped up, ended up knocking him out. And, and then uh, I actually fought again the next day. Um, a month later, I'd been, you know, I'd been back to training and everything. And every time I would get hit, I would see these, this flash of light. And I'm just, you know, I thought I had a concussion. I was like, ah, maybe I have this concussion, but it just wouldn't go away. And this went on for weeks and weeks. Finally, I went to the doctor and they gave me, uh, I don't know if it was a CAT scan or MRI, and they showed me I had an inch and a half crack in the back of my skull. Oh, damn. And the doctor was like, what happened to you? I was like, well, I got kicked in the back of the head. Uh, and I was like, but the guy had his shin pad on, and I was like, I don't know, it broke it. And then he's like, "There's the only way that could break is if there was something harder than your head in that and, and and considering how hard your head is he's like i don't he's like maybe he had like a steel plate in there or I, something else was in there then i come to find out after that 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 was something that happened from time to time people would take the because there are these shim pads that have bamboo strips in them and that's basically mm-hmm. the hard part and they you can take those out and put whatever you want in there oh damn and that's kind of how it uh i ended up finding out that that that, that was the uh case how did it affect you mentally coming back from that? Uh, it didn't really affect me at all, fortunately, at the time. Nowadays, it would probably affect me extremely differently. At the time, I was like, oh, yeah, that sucks. Um, I mean, I honestly, when, the, when I found out my skull was fractured, I was preparing for a fight. And uh, I think it was about a month off. And then the doctor told me that that it was broken and I didn't tell anybody (laughs) that my skull was fractured (laughs) and I went right back through training and everything. And, um, two weeks. Yeah. I think it was two weeks before the fight. We had some kind of a pre fight medicals or, or I don't remember what it was exactly, but the doctor who the fight doctor was my doctor that diagnosed my head. Wow. 
and it's like you cannot fight you shouldn't be here you shouldn't be training and I was like all right all right all right and um you know he pretty much told me you need to stop sparring you need to, like he told me I need to stop doing it I can't even risk falling down because of the fact that my skull was fractured and if um I was to hit my head it could push that piece of my skull into my brain oh. and, and uh I was like all right I guess I'll stop uh sparring so then i uh, was stuck on the bag for a month by myself just doing that and losing my mind and again I, I you know i look back and in some circumstances like yeah fortunately i was young and i didn't think about it and i didn't let it deter me off my path whereas if it happened today I'd be like yeah hey, maybe i should stop doing this um but yeah like i said i didn't i didn't really think about it you know it was just it was just another thing another hurdle uh, another unfortunate circumstance that I had to deal with. And I think, I think that has been a big prevalent mindset for me is it's just, this happens and how are you going to deal with it? How are you going to face it? This loss happens, this injury happens, this skull fracture happens, <laughs> this death happens. You, you, again, you have a choice. What do you want to do about it? Do you want to dwell on it? Do you want to say, Oh, poor me, poor me. This is horrible or deal with it, face it, what do we need to do to get past it and to improve from it? And, you know, that, I think that was always there. It wasn't always a conscious thought, but I think that was my mentality. Yeah. Because, you... because this, what I wanted to do, this sport and, and being the best that I could be was always the, the driving force. You know, I'm not going to let, uh, external circumstances no matter how extreme they are keep me from this path that i spent so much of my life ignoring and, and that has nothing to do with when i learned about muay thai but it was the knowledge of how much of my life i wasted living in defeat and failure and and, and doubt and fear yeah i think there's a perception out there that highly successful people the best don't fear failure or have any sort of you know, self-doubt a lot of people tell themselves a story that would potentially hold them back from achieving their dreams. Now, how have you experienced this in your own journey? I think, I think the understanding of other people's journey has really opened my eyes to my own. You know, like you say, most people don't think those at the top go through this where they probably go through it worse than you do. <laughs> they just understand how to deal with it better. And that's, that's the only thing that I think changes people from one direction to the other. As I said earlier, failures, doubts, all of these things happen on every spectrum there is of a person. Everybody just handles them differently. Yeah. And the more, the more I've gone through life, the more I've heard other people's stories and, and understood things, the more I've realized that everybody faces the same things that everybody else does they're different of course and it's easy to look at someone else's circumstance and be like oh i could deal with that yeah but it's 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 different you know uh, uh my buddy uh fellow fighter eddie abasola he, he always had this good uh, expression which was everybody has dues to pay but they don't know what those dues are or when they when they're when they're owed and and I always found that you know very 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 true is mm. we can look at somebody else's struggle and say well I could do it if that's what I had to deal with you know whether it's whatever it is I, I, I mean you could you could go down a list but the 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 problem is the dues you're gonna have to pay is ones you don't want to pay mm. <laughs> you know what I mean it, it's easy to look at somebody else's circumstance you're like yeah oh, I could do that yeah but you're a different person you're in a different position what it's going to take for you to get where you want to get is go, you're going to have to deal with things and face things and give up things that you don't want to give, give up yeah. and you don't want to face. And, and, and that's why it's so easy to look at someone else's life and think, Oh, I can do that. I can do this. I can do that. No, you couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree with you, man. It's a matter of, um, you know, doing the work. Um, and yeah, seeing where you can put yourself you're definitely a living example of that now successful people tend to have like you said this tendency to be obsessive um always working in that red zone 
is yeah. there like a fine line between doing enough or doing too much, you know, and where is your balance and how has this changed over time? Without a doubt there is. And I've always been on the extreme end of the, just do, do, doing too much. And I think, I do think and believe that you have to be there in order to be successful. Obviously, you can't be on the other end because you're never going to do enough. Finding ways to balance that out has been an ongoing, progressive thing throughout my life and career. Uh, in the beginning, it was just 100% sprint towards the end, you know, go do as much as possible all the time. As the years have gone by, I've learned how to have that same focus, but in, in a much healthier way. But I'll, I think you have to be more on the, the, the too much side than, than the not enough. And, you know, unfortunately, that's just the way it is to be successful at something. I find that the more educated you can be, the healthier you can be, uh, the more self-aware that you can be, the better. But you're still got to be on the far end of that in order to in order to push through things that make you want to stop. Yeah, um, and it's a it's a ongoing, unending uh, process. You know, you never figure out the way. There is no way. It's it, it's continuous. It's 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 unending. Every circumstance presents a new problem, a new challenge. Um, I, had a, I had a really great example of this last year. I think it was last year. I was getting ready for a fight. Um, it was going to be Bellator's first card in Japan. Um, getting to fight there. I fought there once before, but it was a, um, a shoot boxing fight. So it wasn't really my style set. And this was like, oh, finally, I get to go fight in Japan. I get to fight kickboxing, which has just been my dream to fight like like K1 in Japan and to, like where it came from and everything. And I was I was a month away and I felt better than I've ever felt. And this was after coming back from my losing my uh, world title, uh, Bellator world title, you know, going through a phase of I don't know if I'm going to do this anymore. I don't know if I can do this or if I, if I want to do this anymore. Getting over that hurdle, getting back into the gym, having a fight, preparing for it, feeling better than ever. And then I break my freaking thumb uh, sparring a month out. And, you know, for me, it was one of the more minor injuries I've ever had throughout my career. So you would think it would be the easiest one to deal with. But because of the circumstances, it became one of the more difficult ones I had to deal with. And because of that, uh, it's almost like you think you know, <laughs> but you don't ever know. You think you have things figured out, you don't ever have things figured out because circumstances change every dynamic of the problem itself. And so, uh, again, I felt like I'd been through this so many times. You think I would know how to deal with an injury and, and a setback. And I had a few days there when I was just like, well, fuck all this, man. Like, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm too old to do this. And you know, like I've done enough and I don't want to do this anymore. And, and I sat there in my, my depression for, for, you know, it was probably only two days really, but it felt like an eternity. And then just like every other circumstance that's ever happened was you still have a choice. What are you going to do about it? Even if you never fight again, you still have a choice. What kind of lifestyle do you want to live? And it's very easy just to sit there and, and, and self pity, and 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 uh, um, uh, doubt and, and everything else, and just you know start driving my life towards the direction I was already in and previously. And and, and again, it, it's a choice. You you have to make a choice. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what it appears to be. You have a choice which direction you want to go daily, weekly, monthly, and, and moment to moment. We always have a choice how we deal with a certain circumstance. And the more that we can point that in the right direction, the more we're going to end up in more positive places. Yeah. And Kevin, it sounds like the way you talk about things, like you you, say, you ask yourself, you have a choice. What are you going to do about it? For some of us growing up, we some of us had like uh, really influential parents that would, you know, you fell over, bump your knee, start crying. Your parent would go, come on, stand up, dust yourself off, you know, move forward did you ever have these sort of people because sometimes you know like these make the difference and people yeah. once become adults say sometimes stop doing that like what was yeah. it for you did you have anyone that 
kind of influence you? Well, I think like a lot of things in the moments, we don't recognize them. Now I can look back and say, oh, well, yeah, that played an enormous role into my life. And mm. uh, I can look back. My, my father was very influential in that mindset of one like obviously like things aren't fair in life so get that out of your freaking head <laughs> two if you want something you're gonna have to go after it and get it no one's gonna hand it to you nobody's gonna give it to you and if they do give it to you that can be one of the worst things you've ever received in your entire life mm -hmm. if you don't take it the right way of course um so i think that mentality or very early on played a, a, an extremely significant role throughout my life uh, the problem being when it was pointed in the wrong direction, it was, it was extremely negative. Like everything we, we, we can take things in two ways. You know, we, we have a choice whether even a, a bad thing can be a great thing and a great thing can be a bad thing. Mm. It's just a matter of what you want to do with it. So again, most of my life, half my life, I didn't view things in that way. Once I did, then I started understanding how that mentality can play into a, a, an extremely positive uh, direction. Yeah. So nothing's owed. Nothing's entitled. Everything's going to work. Yeah. The, the sooner you let go of that, the better. And and that's even on a uh, personal, like like with friends, like they don't owe you anything. Fortunately, they we have this camaraderie. Uh, camad, I, I can't think of the word. <laughs> camaraderie. Camaraderie. Yeah. And um, but they don't owe you anything. Like you, we have this expectation of people. We have this expectation of life. We have this expectation of circumstances. Like we, we're owed something. Mm. I'm nice to you. You owe it to me to be nice. But when you think about it is if you're only being nice to somebody because they're nice to you, that, that isn't really good. If you're only being charitable because you're going to get something out of it, that defeats the entire purpose of everything. No matter what happens, it's it's whatever is inside of you like you can be a good person even though everything in the world is telling you to you, you need to stop because nothing's working out and vice versa you know so it's all it's all accountability um yeah. and, and self-awareness and all of these things that we tend to look externally for um but it's really it all comes from within at the end of the day Everything, everything we want to do, everything we are, everything we think, believe, and feel, we always have a choice in that. And, and it's far too easy to look externally and say, I'm this way because of X, because my life, because of my parents, because of the circumstances. But all you have to do is, is educate yourself on, on the rest of the people in the world and understand, one, there's people that have it way worse than you do and are doing these things that you want to do. And nothing easy comes from to anybody. And when it does, it's usually not the best thing there is. Yeah. Now, just relating to that, I we see, and you've probably seen a lot over the years as well, someone that maybe starts Muay Thai and they are not developing as quickly as they'd like to, or they're very harsh on themselves and their development. And they have a tendency to give up when the going gets tough because, you know, they thought it might be a six month process to become amazing at it. What do you have to say? <laughs> to I think for me, what has always helped is the fact that there is no peak, of course, you know, this, this, this perfection and ability goes forever. Um, but realizing how far you are away from even the peak of your field, say the sport. I'm so far away from that. I can't, there's nothing, I, I can't use, let anything slow me down from that. Even if it's failure, like the people at the top went through the same things that I go through in different ways. So what excuse do I have not to keep pushing myself? I, I don't have one. I, I, every, everybody has circumstances that are worse and better than you you don't have an excuse that is more valid than anyone else's. And, and that's another thing I think that we tend to do is we feel that our excuses, our circumstances and everything else gives us reason and an excuse not to do the things that we want to do, not to be the person that we want to be. But so many people have it so much worse than you do and are that 
and are doing that thing or are that way naturally anyways. So your excuses, our excuses are all, I feel like everyone's excuses are invalid because of that fact. You know, no matter how bad it is, somebody has it worse. Somebody has it better. Somebody has different circumstances than you. And, and everyone's situation is so com complex to that individual. It's, you can't compare things. You can't compare apples and oranges. You can't compare Muay Thai and kickboxing. They're different sports. Mm. They, don't, they don't correlate. They don't, you can't say this person is better than this person. It's a different field. It's a different sport. And even, even if you break it down to, to more detailed things, even in the sport, things are different. It's a different day. It's a different era. It's a different time. You, they're not comparable. Things are not comparable. So us as individuals, as complex as we are, things are not comparable. I can't say my life is better or worse than you than yours just from what I perceive as to be the way that it is. Yeah. So none of those things have any validation because of that fact. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very unique way to look at things and I'm sure that sets you apart from all the rest. Like you said, the winners from the champions, the good from the great. Now, there are a few books about the habits of successful people. Let's flip this idea around on its head. Kevin, in your opinion, what are habits or traits of unsuccessful people? You know, it's funny because uh, you sent me your questions ahead of time. I try not to, I try, when people do that, it's, it's great. Of course, uh, I try to get a generalized idea, but it's kind of the same way I uh, um, look at studying fighters and stuff. Like, I like to have a general idea, but if I don't, um, if I look too much into it, things aren't going to come out the right way. Mm. Um, yeah, but that was one that stood out to me. And I thought about, why don't we write a book on what people do wrong? Like we all, we, there's a million books on how to be better, how to do things right. Be like, but let's focus on why, why do people do, like what do they do that, that breaks them down? And what is it? And, uh, you know, I think it's ironic that that's not out there like that everybody can talk about how to how to be better <laughs> but what what are the things that make you worse what are the factors and, and and for me um it's 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 a combination of a lot of things but it really comes down to focus yeah focus uh uh, uh but a more along the lines of it's that that uh whole victim mentality and Earlier in my life, and, and I'd say most of my life, I, I looked at that as a, yeah, I am a victim. Everybody's a victim of something, you know? So, of course, I have that victim mentality. This horrible thing happened to me. Of course, I feel this way. And understandably so. But you have a choice. You do have a choice. We are all victims of something. Circumstance, uh, where we were born, who we were born to and an infinite number of other things, but we have a choice. And the only thing that separates the ones who do and the ones that don't is the choice they make. It's not the circumstances. And far too often we highlight the circumstance and be like, well, yeah, of course you didn't do this because of this. And they only did this because of this factor, but you're not looking at the whole picture. They had a, a, an infinite number of things that you could view as, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to get through that either. Um, so again, it's, it's that accountability in having a choice. That is really the only thing I've ever found that has separated the ones who do and the ones that don't. Is that they made a choice and like, I'm going to do it anyway. And, and the other people say, well, I'm not going to do it because of this. And the more you hear people's stories, the more you read and learn about people's stories. And, you know, this, a lot of this was after the fact, because I kind of was going that way anyway. But when I go back and, 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 and uh, that's why I love reading uh, biographies and autobiographies is you really understand the complexity of what these people went through and the hardships and the failures and everything else that came with it. You know, it, you look at these people that have been successful we're like, oh, there's no way I can do that. But when you go back and look through everything they went through, you might have not been able to go through those failures either, but you can understand that they went through them too. 
and they deal with the doubts and the fears and the failures that you do. We all deal with them. And the more open and honest that we can all be, particularly the people in the spotlight and at the top, the, the more others can understand that they can, they can make it too. I find that most of the time we don't because we think, oh, I didn't have this upbringing. I didn't have this talent. I didn't have this ability. I didn't have this uh, uh, um, benefit. But when you really look at it, you see how many times people have failed. 90% of the time, people are failing their way to success. Nothing is handed to anybody. Um, and even the ones that have, handed, have had it handed to them still had to pursue and push past that because there's plenty of people that have had things handed to them and just crushed it or failed at it and, and destroyed it. And then there's ones that had it handed to them be like, I'm going to take responsibility of this gift that I have and I'm going to use it to drive me. So understanding that we all have those things. We all have certain abilities, and we have, all have certain things that are holding us back. What we do with them is the only thing that differentiates one person from another, not necessarily this person having uh, uh, better things than you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing, man. The outlook you have is very unique, and um, it's a matter of choices, and um, like you said, just making making it work for yourself and not sitting around waiting for it to happen. Yeah, and again, that's a. Um, it's not that I'm just like here in this mentality and I'm here forever. It's a daily thing. It's a it's a moment to moment thing. Even if you break it down to that level, it's it's a continuous pursuit pursuit of going in the right direction. Yeah, and uh, you know, again, it's easy to look at people that have uh, succeeded and done things and think they're just that way forever. Like it's, it's, it's every day. It is every day. I could, I could, I know that where I was previously in my life is, is right behind me. It, all I have to do is have one bad day and I'm going right back there very easily. I can destroy everything that I've done in the last 20 years by one bad day, you know? And that's, that's really always the motivating factor for me is is understanding that that's never any farther away no matter how far away from it i get it's 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 a one moment away it's one bad decision it's one just uh, i don't feel like it today mm. and then i don't feel like it tomorrow and three days later i'm right where i used to be yeah now, Kevin, a lot of people know you as the Muay Thai legend that you are and the Muay Thai champion. You know, where does, or not a lot of people know where, the, you know, your art and what it is that inspires you to do that. Where does it sit in, in your world? My art, you know, I, I used to always think that my art was something that was just always there. I didn't view it along the same lines that I viewed fighting to me, you know. Um, it was just, I've always done this. It's always been there. I've always been artistic, but there was a period of time in my life when I let that slip away and I stopped practicing it. And then years later, when I picked it back up, I, I realized like, you don't just have this. It's not just a gift to you. It's a, it's, it's something you're given, but you have to continually be using it. You know, you have to continually be pursuing um, perfection in this or, or, or at least ability in this or else it's going to go the other direction if you aren't getting better you are getting worse there is no in between there's a way to maintain of course but that still requires a work so if you're not working towards something you're definitely uh, falling away from it and um, yeah like I said for me with my art what that that happens you know I was, I was forced to face that I, I stopped doing art for a really long, like years and years and uh, I tried to pick it back up again I was like oh shit <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm doing so it's one of those things that um, you know I, I for me like Muay Thai is something that that if I don't do or think about on a regular basis I it affects me negatively like depression and in a lot of other ways but but art for me isn't as extreme as that but but it's still there too so what that lesson taught me is you have to you got to maintain at least some level of ability in this field or else it's going to go away um, so i try to always just maintain a, a 
a, a decent level of ability. And then when I have time or whether I'm when I'm inspired, I pick a lot of those things up. Like what I used to do before was like most of the time I'm training, I don't time for anything. And then mm. as soon as a fight is over, that's when I'm going to do some pieces of artwork or writing or whatever that may be. But, but then I also started understanding it's the same way with fighting you know you have people that that they're so focused and so dedicated then the fight happens and they disappear for however long and then they come back and they're not improving they're just trying to get back to where they were before so all of these things have kind of played played into each other where i understood you have to maintain a certain level or else it's going to deteriorate it's going to go away it's not going to stay there yeah. So I try to always, I try to maintain a, a, a baseline of ability in all of these different things that I do. The problem being that I do a lot of different things and uh, I, I kind of pick up certain things when, when the time is there, but, but a continuous maintenance of that. Uh, but as far as art goes, I, I really do feel that everything that I try to do in life has some element of artistry to it whether it's fighting or actual art or writing or, or cooking or, or whatever. Um, I, I feel like I have an artistic view of the world. Life imitating art, as I'd say. Um, just draw, dialing back to what you said about, you know, playing catch up with, we see fighters have a fight and they disappear forever. You know, like I, I'd love to know for yourself, how long would you take between fights before coming back to training? Zero days. <laughs> <laughs> be back on monday <laughs> yeah uh and you know again like in the beginning that's easier to do as it goes the more you're putting into it and also the more you're taking uh taking from it you know because of that that fact so mm -hmm. it's not to say everybody should train 24 hours a day and then the second the fight's over you get back in the gym and do that you know that again that was a um a learning process that I had to figure out because I was so extreme. And then I started recognizing you still need to, there's an ebb and flow of everything. You know, you, you can't go so extreme all the time because you're going to start deteriorating and breaking yourself down mentally and physically and emotionally. And as the years went on, I started recognizing this and, you know, it got to a point when my coaches had to force me out of the gym. They're like, you're not allowed to come back here for a week. I'm going to lock the door. If you show up here, I'm kicking you out. And it started with that, with, with, I was forced to take breaks. You know, I, I didn't want to. And even when I was by myself, I was still working out. And, and as once I started doing that, I started recognizing the benefit of it. You know, like you do need to have this back and forth. It can't be, you can't sprint all the time. Like it's not health, healthy and helpful. You know, in the long run, you're, you're holding yourself back because you're trying to go so hard. And the longer that I've done this, the more I've understood that changing of gears, um, going hard when it's time to go hard, um, slowing down when it's time to slow down and, and learning that there's gears and stages to everything. And, and the more you recognize that, the more you can build up and peak at the right time and slow down. Um, when you're not, but you're not stopping, you're just slowing down and idling and, and it's been a progressive thing. And, and just like everything else, you never really have it figured out because you can't replicate that same thing twice. You try to do it for one fight and then you try to do it again and you're not going to have the same results. So it's an, it's an ongoing, unending learning process that all of this goes through. You know, we all, we all go through it and, and, you know, the tricky thing is like, I can look back on the beginning of my career and say, yeah, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do this. But at the same time, I also wouldn't have got the, the, the positive things out of that. I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I didn't do things psychotically like I did them in the beginning. So it's tough to say, one, I wouldn't change anything because I don't know if I'd be in a better position or worse position. And two, it's difficult to uh, um, convey this to other people that are going through similar circumstances, like talking to a younger generation, how to train smarter and better. I'm like, I don't know, like you kind of got to do it stupid and figure it out yourself. <laughs> like, I think that we can all guide each other and, and give advice, but when it comes down to it, we all got to carve our own path, you know, and, and where I'm at today is a completely different place completely different mentality i'm a completely different person than i was when i started so 
you know, it's always going to be different. You're, you, when you, when you ask somebody for advice, you also have to take into account where they're at in their life. And at that time, and you know, you take these things, um, you can learn the, learn from them, but you still have to do it your own way. It's, you're always going to have to do it your own way. Yeah, absolutely, man. Very powerful. And nobody, nobody, nobody has the answer either. So <laughs> you can try and replicate everything that I did to a T and it still will always result in something different, better or worse. You don't know. Yeah, absolutely, man. Now, Kevin, um, what can we expect for the future for Kevin Ross? Are we going to see you fight again? I sure hope so, but I don't think, I don't think, you know, it's like this whole thing that's going on in the world is a, is a perfect example of you just don't ever know, you know, you, you prepare yourself as best you can. You have goals, you have dreams, but you have to be able to adjust and shift things depending on the circumstance. Um, I hope to fight again. I really want to, and I'm trying to maintain a certain level of shape during all of this and, and not fall off the deep end. Uh, um, but you know, like the first, the first two weeks were pretty hard for me. And then just like everything else, just like every other situation I faced, I, I sat there for a minute. I'm like, you still have a choice. Even if you don't ever fight again, even if you don't ever get to train again, how do you want to live? I'm like, I don't want to live like a piece of shit. <laughs> I don't want to live and just like drinking and eating and smoking and doing all these horrible things. I still want to be healthy. I still want to be active. I still want to do this. So s just start there, you know, start where you would be even if you didn't ever get the fight again all right i started there and then it was progressively all right well i want to you know tr train a little more specifically you know i want to do this daily and then kind of this week has been training with much more intentionally like we're doing circuits that we used to do and, and drills that we used to do and you know again it's just a matter of we just don't know but but we can still make a decision that's, that's very, very true. But yeah, I do hope to fight again if, if I can. Awesome, man. It'd be great to see you fight again. Now, Kevin, before we wrap up, uh, we've got a 67, uh, 60, a 60 second challenge for yourself. A bit of fun. Um, basically, I ask you a question and you shoot back to me. First thing that comes to mind as quick as you can. Are you, are you, are you keen to get involved with that? Sure. Awesome. Yeah, ready. We'll ready. start the clock. So, uh, when you're ready? Go. All righty, man. So, your celebrity crush. <laughs> uh, Monica Bellucci. <laughs> Describe your fight style. Mm, aggressive. What is your favorite dr uh, drunk food? Pizza. Pizza. What was your first job and how old were you? First job, I was a stock boy at Best Buy. Uh, six, 18, 16, 18, somewhere around there. Who has been your hardest ever fight and why? Uh, hardest ever thing I've ever gone through was my fight with Bernie Mendieta, which was my second line fight. And that's because I had bronchitis in the flu at the time and didn't know. So that, that was the most difficult fight to get through because of that. And I had to, I was literally felt like I was being held underwater and I had to fight anyway. Damn. What is the heaviest you've ever been? Mm, probably 165 maybe i try to always stay below like what's that like 70 72 kilos maybe nice what three items would you take to a deserted island to survive survive uh my girl my dogs and a knife <laughs> <laughs> at what age did you become a man oh I don't think there's ever an age. I think it's an unending journey like everything else. It's, it's progressive. You never, it's never a destination. What would you tell your younger self? You're going to live a lot longer than you thought. <laughs> <laughs> what music do you listen to in training? I guess it depends. You know, whenever I'm doing boxing, I like to listen to more Spanish music. And whenever I'm doing conditioning, I like to listen to a lot more like hardcore uh, metal or, 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 or things like that. So it really just depends on what I'm doing at the time. Who was the best date you've ever been on? Who was? Yeah. Or what was? Who? Who? Was? Who? Uh, my lady, Gina. Um, we've been on a lot of really 
amazing dates. <laughs> 20 years of, of knowing each other and, and doing this, so it's been a lot. Awesome. Hi to Gina as well. Um, most embarrassing gym story? Who? You know, I don't, I don't know if I've ever been like embarrassed in the gym, but, but I, funny, there's a lot of been a lot of funny circumstances. Like one, I don't know if it's funny, it's kind of dangerous. I, we were, uh, Gaston and I were sparring in the ring and I was going backwards and I like tripped and the angle of what, that I was at, I fell through the ropes all the way down to the floor below, which was a few feet and smashed my head and rolled over and, and, and you know, at the time I just jumped back in the ring, got back to the training. And then I went back and looked back thinking if there was something in the way, like a, a hammer or a piece of metal or something like that could have been the end of me. Or if I landed on my head, strangely, you know, at the time that was, uh, I didn't think about it. But then looking back, like, yeah, it was pretty dangerous. Who is your biggest inspiration and why? In fighting, uh, it's always been Arturo Gatti. He's, been my hero since day one the the resolve and, and 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 dedication he had to pushing through circumstances that said you should just look stop you know you should quit and you should give up because you just got dropped and your body broken and you should give up and then seeing that happen and, and moving forward anyway regardless of the outcome of a fight was that was just a representation of everybody's got a choice. What are you going to do about it? You're going to go forward or are you going to quit? And, and for me, he has always been, and fighters like him, were, have always been the people that I've been drawn to because of that fact. If you could fight anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Whew. I always wanted to fight uh, Cal. Fairtex is not Fairtex anymore, but he's just... Uh, especially since starting in kickboxing and stuff, he was always someone stylist. I always want to fight people that stylistically I enjoy watching fight. If I don't enjoy watching you fight, I don't want to fight you. You know, I don't, I don't want to be in there with you. And, you know, you know, you can say what you want about that, but the people I like to fight and want to fight are people that I enjoy watching fight. Yeah. And Cal's living, living it up in Japan now saying, so maybe yeah. one That'll be awesome once this is all this craziness is all over. So, yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, your mindset and the journey you've been through and being down as an individual definitely sets you apart from the rest. And I admire you as a as an athlete, but also as an artist. Um, for our listeners out there, um, have you ever been out to Australia? No. You know, Australia is the only place I've never been that I've always wanted to go. And I love it. I we'd, love, been we'd love to have you out either doing uh, in a fight um, or doing seminars. It'd be great to have you out here one day, um, yourself yeah, and Gina, sure. if you could get the yeah. opportunity to visit. Uh, right, is there anything right. you'd like to, to share with our listeners or anything you'd like to say before we get off today? Uh, no, I just hope everybody's uh, stayed safe out there. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to put good stuff out there and then obviously on the fighting situation, trying to, trying to always push myself and, and, and do my best. So I appreciate everybody that follows me, everyone that's uh, been there um, and, and, and everybody that cares and the people that don't care. You know, pay attention <laughs> anyway. I, I, I'm grateful for them too. Awesome. So thank you so much, Kevin Ross. This has been another episode of a champion's mind. Be sure to follow us on Spotify uh, and on Instagram at champions gym. Uh, my name is Pumon Marte and it's been a pleasure today, Kevin Ross. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. All righty. So I'll cut it there, man. And um, yeah, just want to say thank you so much for being on the show, man. Obviously, after... Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, your answers are amazing, man. And like, it's just it's crazy. But yeah, like I said, you... you I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I, you know, I just, <laughs> I just talk and <laughs> hopefully it works out. But I don't know. It's yeah. just the way, the way I think and the way I... Definitely, man. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate it. And I'm going to put this out probably next week. If you don't mind sharing on your socials, that'd be awesome, man. And uh, Yeah, no doubt, man. Yeah, shoot me, uh, shoot me whatever it is and I'll for sure put it up. You've got a very big following here in Australia, um, whether you know it or not. Yeah, that's always crazy to me. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. As, as I said earlier, I, or I don't know if I said earlier, but I don't feel any different than it did the day I started. So when I when I see fans or especially people in other countries, mm. it's, it's the most surreal thing you can ever imagine. I just tell people, imagine 
you're me for a second, it feels just as weird to me as if it would, <laughs> as if it would to you, if not, if not more so, Yeah, you know, no, it's yeah, amazing. So that, it's always cool. And, and like I said, I've always wanted to go to Australia. So I really appreciate the uh, people there. Have you ever fought Liam Harrison? No, you know, we were, we were supposed to fight on a handful of occasions. One time, like we had it, I don't know if it was ever signed, but uh, prior, I think it was um, before, might have been before I fought Sanchai. We had mm. a fight set, and then something always happened, you know, on both sides, you know, whether it was an injury, whether it was the card getting canceled. <laughs> it was always one of those things that was just right there all the time, and it just never happened. Yeah. And I think, I think that both of us were motivated and tried to make it happen. But then you also take into account uh, different organizations, different times, you know, all of these, there's so many other factors that go into it, whether than, oh, I want to fight you and you want to fight me. It's not that simple. You know, there's yeah. so much more to it. Like, yeah, I'm going to wait six months to fight you. So I don't have anything that gets in the way. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to, I'm going to fight you. I got to fight. And then, schedule wise and everything else yeah it just never happened man. fair enough man it's funny you said gal fairtex as well he used to date my sister when she was living there so um, oh yeah pretty close yeah, i just always uh fight. even even when he was uh fighting muay thai i was just i thought he had the cool dope style real good hand amazing hands obviously and then yeah once he went into k1 he really just set himself apart stylistically i always really enjoyed his his style yeah, man, man, I could pick your brain for hours and we could talk forever. Cause uh, I feel yeah. like you know, I just got, you got such an amazing mindset up here and I, I really relate to, I'm a creative person myself. I didn't want to say too much, but painting, drawing, and I've created everything with champions gym just through what you said, the creativity, but you know, my wife says you got to paint more, you got to draw more. And I'm like, <laughs> I ain't got the like, time. How, how am I supposed to juggle all the, like, I feel the same way. Like, how, how do I juggle all those things? And, and, mm. and how do you not only juggle them, but how do I improve in all of these at the same time because as i said it's i can maintain them for sure but i want to i want to get better how do i get better i don't know i don't know if, as soon as you figure that out let me know <laughs> do you prefer drawing painting or is it more the graphic stuff or writing i think drawing is the most instinctual thing but probably because drawing was always there as the years went on you know more digital means and painting and everything else uh, came into play so drawing is what i prefer to do and the easiest thing for me to do but not what i tend to do awesome, these days. Yeah. thank you so much for your time